The Christian in Complete Armor by William Grinnell Ephesians chapter 6 verse 17b Chapter 12 Why the Word of God is called the Sword of the Spirit, and from it the point raised. Having dispatched the first part, which presented us with the weapon itself commended to the Christian's use, that is, the Word of God, the second part of the text now comes under our consideration and that is the notion under which this weapon is commended, or the metaphor in which it is covered, that is, the sword of the Spirit. And here a double inquiry would be made. First, why the word of God is compared to a sword. Secondly, why this sword is attributed to the Spirit and bears his name, the sword of the Spirit. For the first, let this suffice, the sword being both of general and constant use among soldiers, and, also, that weapon with which they not only defend themselves, but do the greatest execution upon their enemies, most fitly sets forth the necessity and excellent use of the word of God, by which the Christian both defends himself and offends, yea, cuts down before him all his enemies. For the second, why is this sword attributed to the Spirit? Some take the abstract here to be put for the concrete, the sword of the Spirit, for the spiritual sword, as if it were no more but take the spiritual sword, which is the Word of God, according to that of the Apostle, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty. That is spiritual. Indeed, Satan, being a spirit, must be fought with spiritual arms, and such is the word, a spiritual sword. But this, though true, reaches not the full sense of the place. The Greek word is taken, personal litter, for the person of the Holy Spirit. And in these three respects, the written word is the sword of the Spirit. First, he is the author of it, a weapon it is, which his hand alone formed and fashioned. It cannot come out of any creature's forge. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 21. Secondly, the Spirit is the only true interpreter of the word. Hence that known passage of Bernard. The scripture must be read and can be understood by that Spirit alone and by whom they were made. He that made the log can only help us to a key that will fit its wards and open its sense. No prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Second Peter one twenty, And why not? It follows because it came not from a private spirit at first. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, etc. Verse 21. And who knows the mind of the Spirit so well as himself? Thirdly, it is only the Spirit of God can give the Word its efficiency and power in the soul. It is his office, as I said. Except he lays his weight on the truths we read and hear to apply them close and as it were cut their very image in our minds and hearts, they leave no more impression than a seal set upon a rock or a stone would do. Still the mind fluctuates and the heart is unsatisfied, notwithstanding our own and others' utmost endeavors to the contrary. It was not the disciples rowing, but Christ's coming, that could quiet the storm or bring them to shore. Not all our study or inquiry can fix the mind or pacify the heart in the belief of the word till the Spirit of God comes. Do ye now believe, saith Christ to his disciples? John chapter 16 verse 31 How often, alas, had the same things sounded in their ears and knocked at their door for entertainment but never could be reached till now that the Spirit put, for, put in his finger to lift up the latch. B. Period Davenite, that's D A V E N A N T, on Colossians, tells us a story out of Gerson, G E R S O M. 
concerning a holy man whom himself knew to be sadly beaten and buffeted with frequent doubts and scruples, even so as to call into question an article of faith, but afterwards was brought into so clear a light and full evidence of its truth that he doubted no more of it than of his own being. And this certainly, saith Gerson, did not come from any new argument he had found out to demonstrate the truth of it, but from the Spirit of God, humbling and captivating his proud understanding and irradiating the same. The words thus opened present this doctrine, that the written word, or the Spirit, is the sword by which the Spirit of God enables the saints to overcome all their enemies. The Spirit will do nothing for them without the Word, and they can do nothing to purpose without Him. The Word is the sword, and the Spirit of Christ the arm, which welds it in and for the saints. All the great conquests which Christ and his saints achieve in the world are got from this sword. When Christ comes forth against his enemies, this sword is girded on his thigh. Psalms chapter 45 verse 3. Gird thy sword upon thy thigh, O most mighty, and his victory over them ascribe to it. Verse 4. And in thy majesty ride prosperously because of truth, that is, the word of truth. We find Revelations one sixteen, Christ holding seven stars in his right hand, imitating the great care he hath over his people, particularly the ministers, who are more shot at than any other. And how doth he protect them but by his sharpened two-edged sword coming out of his mouth? This is the great privilege which the poorest believer in the church hath by the covenant of grace such a one as Adam had not in the first covenant. He, when fallen, had a flaming sword to keep him out of paradise, but had no such sword when innocent to keep him from sinning, and so from being turned out of that happy place and state. No, he was left to stand upon his own defense and by his vigilance to be a lifeguard to himself. But now the word of God stands between the saints in all danger. This will the better appear if we single out the chief enemies with whom the saints' war is waged and show how they all fall before the word and receive their fatal blow from this one sword. As Amalek slew the threescore sons of uh, Jerubel uh, upon one stone. Judges chapter 9 verse 5. End of chapter 12.